I'm Elizabeth Hines and welcome back to Coast Connections. We all enjoy our beautiful coastal waters, whether we're out on a boat, surfing, fishing, walking along our beautiful shorelines. It's a beautiful place to live until you come across a funky patch of garbage and crap uh, washing against the shore or against your surfboard. Do you know that there's going to be more trash and plastics in the ocean than there are fish in about 30 years by 2050? But it's not all bad news. We've got a group called Rugged Coast uh, Society who are doing a lot of work to clean up this god awful mess that's uh, hanging around our waters here. And let's introduce them with this quick little video that shows them in action. via Skype. <laughs> Welcome to Ben Armstrong and to Rennie Talbot from the Rugged Coast Research Society. Thank you so much guys for coming in off the water to uh, spend some time with us on the screen here so we can help promote the great work that you're doing here on our coastline. Ben, that's you in the tooth, I see, cover your uh, COVID do. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep it under wraps a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. And Rennie, I understand that you're the, uh, the director of the Rugged Coast Research Society. That's correct. Yeah, no need to, to hide what I have. <laughs> <laughs> now, you guys um, have a passion for plastics and all this debris. And to me, that's incredible that you'd actually go out and spend your time cleaning up our waters. That's, you know, the, we need to have some uh, superheroes. Uh, little plastic dolls made out of people like you who are going out there to clean up our coastlines. So first of all, thank you for what you're doing. And uh, you started the society in about 2017. And uh, Rennie, where do you actually go to start looking for this? Like, how do you prioritize where you're going to go and where you're going to find um, the debris that's along our coastline? Yeah, yeah. No, well, we started... Um, looking in, in remote areas um, because of our, our our passion for adventure and and uh, and uh, skill in, in navigating remote areas of, in west coast areas exposed areas of British Columbia uh, we decided to focus on those areas and so we've been mapping debris from from central coast around the Bella Coola area Bella Bella area sorry and all the way down the west coast of Vancouver Island um, and trying to yeah pinpoint the, the, the high high accumulation areas within those remote stretches and then prioritize our cleanup based on the accumulation that's there and, and the ecosystem that's present. So I'm a biologist by trade. So we try to do that, the, have those two lenses to, to prioritize our cleanup efforts. Mm, very good. And Ben, uh, first of all, thanks for that video that you provided. It's a really nice uh, piece of work that you did there. Uh, you're an enthusiast for things uh, artistic. I can see that. Um, <laughs> And when you're out there, um, what types of de debris are you finding? What is most common out there? Um, if I had to pick something that was most common by scale, would probably be, um, I think it's where they come from isn't totally clear, but there's a lot of giant foam blocks. Um, and they're made up of, they're styrofoam blocks, basically, that come from docks or aquaculture uh, structures or things that just get hit by a storm or get old or get abandoned a lot of the time as well and they break up and they end up finding their way into these little alcoves and little hidden spots and there's millions of them around there and there is the just the sheer volume because a lot of them might be five or six feet long and then about two foot square so they're big massive pieces of, of debris so volume wise that's probably one of the biggest biggest issues we see out there and then on top of that, there's everything. <laughs> it's hard to pinpoint. There's 
a lot of uh, fishing industry debris, a lot of netting, a lot of floats, a lot of plastic and foam floats and things like that. And some, um, and then a lot of domestic debris, um, some from here, some from overseas finds its way into the waterways. Obviously there's a lot of, a lot of people think of water bottles and plastic bags and things like that. And there is a lot of that. Um, but that's, that's not as much as our issue here on this part of the coast as it is elsewhere. That domestic debris, those plastic bags and things like that, ours is very much, a lot of it is industry-based or lost fishing gear or people's docks that have broken down and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now, Randy, that, it takes a lot of work to have the equipment and personnel to go out there and actually, uh, A, first of all, find this, map it, and then uh, retrieve it. There must be that must be rather dangerous work too because you're hauling in you know a lot of stuff that's uh, rather unhealthy um mm -hmm. and safe so how do you actually go about that and what kind of equipment are you using well a lot of our um volunteers to date we've been uh, a very volunteer based uh, organization it's mostly just our our community and and it started off actually as our, our surfing community um and so a lot of our the majority of our volunteers and and, and members are, are very skilled watermen. And so surfing and, and paddle boarding, and these are our, what we do is passion, and we put those passions to, to this work. Um, and so we paddle board into areas, and, um, and uh, you know, with, with the skills that we have, we're able to navigate through the surf and get to those beaches to be able to do our surveys and collect our garbage and, and, uh, and take it out. Um, it is, there is inherent risk associated with all the work that we do, but um, we've been doing navigating along the coast and for a recreational standpoint for a long time. And, and we learned what's, what's safe and what's not. And, and of course we take that extra mile when we're, when we're doing this, this type of work to ensure that the safety of our crew and, you know, we only go when the weather's good and, and uh, we always access beaches that, uh, that are safe to do so. And from a d d debris standpoint, when it's hazardous material, liquids that aren't identifiable, we, we leave those alone. We, we just tackle the, the, the debris that we can, carry with the with the with the human power that we have and and uh, we leave the real dangerous stuff unfortunately behind um because of the um the just the unknown nature of, of, associated with it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and when you actually are collecting um the the trash and plastic and foam um and you're bringing that to shore how are you disposing of it what comes what becomes of it once it's brought to shore what's that process like yeah, so there's a there's a good facility um, uh, called Ocean Legacy. They have a, a, a the Ocean Legacy has a facility in Vancouver that actually recycles a lot of uh, a lot of marine debris, um, and so we are able to sort it, and we can we, we can send uh, a, a portion of that debris to uh, to Ocean Legacy's facility for recycling. However, a lot of debris cannot be recycled um, just because just the nature of, of the material, and so unfortunately, a lot of that debris goes to the landfill. Yeah, we for for some of the the uh, floats like the large larger uh, hard plastic fishing floats. I actually have a big stash from at the house here. I'm going to turn them into planters, and uh, and, and 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 donate them or try to uh, sell them or just give them away. But they're 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 cool planters because they have little handles at the top, and you can and you can uh, hang them off of trees and do different things like that. So try to repurpose as much as we can as well. I love it. Yeah. yeah, recover it and reuse it as much as you can. Yeah. yeah. Um, ben, what are some of the most uh, uh, unusual finds that you've had? Any messages in a bottle out there or anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, un unusual things. No messages in a bottle, unfortunately. That's what we're still still searching for, I think. <laughs> but um, something that I know um, Owen Gardner, one of the one of the kind of founding members of Red Coast, he's uh, for whatever reason, he's a magnet for different beachcombing treasures, and there's uh, you've probably heard of them or seen them. Those glass, those glass fishing floats, kind of wrapped in net. Yeah. And for, for whatever reason, Owen's a bit of a magnet, and he goes off by himself, and he says, "I'm going to go find some glass floats, and he'll come back with he'll come back with one." Or lots of lots of really old kind of fishing floats and things that have just somehow miraculously not smashed into anything and broken apart. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as strange i don't know that a lot of uh a lot of half broken down recreational vessels that you kind of wonder what the story is you kind of wonder how this little tin boat got broken into pieces and are the people okay or like how did it end up here did it just fall off the back of somebody's uh industrial boat or something 
So those ones always kind of leave it open or things from afar with different printing on it and different writing on it are always kind of unique to find. But I, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that stands out as the most unique. I don't know if you can, Rennie, but. Yeah, no, I, some strange like car parts, like you, you'll find, you know, you'll find the front end of a car way out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> How did this car get here? <laughs> so a few, a few things like that, but, uh, but yeah, for the most part, it's um, pretty typical stuff that you would expect on on the beach from the industries that uh, that that, uh, that we encounter out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Ben, you mentioned that you are a marine biologist, as are some of your colleagues there at Rugged Coast. There's you come from a scientific background as well. Um, how are you helping? How does removing the debris actually help to restore the marine habitat? What are the benefits there for um, those in the water that we share our coast with? I'll let, uh, I'll let Rennie answer that one because he's a biologist, actually. I, I'm, a, I'm an electrician by trade and a filmmaker <laughs> and kind of project management kind of stuff. So I'll let Rennie answer that one. But Ben's learning quick on the biology yeah, side. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. So, um, what happens uh, is the the debris when it gets to the shoreline, um, it breaks up in the in logs in storm and wave action. It'll break up into small bits, and uh, and as that debris breaks down, um, it becomes available for ingestion uh, from from uh, sea, sea sea animals, um, especially the polystyrene, the the styrofoam. It breaks down into little pellets, essentially. They look like just little round balls, and um, and they look a lot like forage fish eggs, like fish from uh, surf smelt or sand lance. And so, other fish, um, you know, whether it be polystyrene or whether it be little bits of plastic, uh, they don't really have the ability to to, to know it's plastic versus versus um, you know sea sea organisms that they can eat. And so that ingestion, uh, uh, ingesting that the, the plastics really disrupts their uh, their uh, insides and and their digestive system, and and can lead to suffocation and and um, and you know the lack of uh, it has a whole, there's a whole host of things that can lead to but suffocation is one of the main thing and the lack of ability to eat more so they so they'll they'll die from um, uh, from starvation um, and also plastics. Uh, Toxins in the environment, the marine environment, will bind the plastics. And so, if there is, if there are toxics from industrial facilities or, or anything like that that's floating around up there, they have a, they bind to plastic because of the chemical properties. And so, it, it provides a, a, a conduit or a corridor um, for those toxins to get into our food web as well. And so, those toxins will get to the plastics. The fish will eat it, and then it'll it'll bioaccumulate into the into the flesh of the of the organism. Or the animal, and then we eat it, and essentially we'll get we'll get those toxins in us. Um, in addition to ingestion, uh, uh, debris, marine mammals and fish they can get tangled in the debris, and uh, and and die that way uh, from, through suffocation or or just you know wounds that they can die from. I probably see lots of um, there's lots of images online of of seals and sea lions that are that get caught up in the in in net fishing debris and have lacerations and things like that. So uh, multifaceted, the impacts on the environment there, but um, yeah, it's, yeah, no, that's why we want to get it out, out. There's just too much of it out there right now. And and so the more we can remove, the more we mitigate those impacts uh, to, to our and green plants. seeing almost um, a million seabirds alone, just in birds a year uh, through ocean plastics. And as you say, what they ingest it and it's, they actually starve to death too, don't they, uh, Rennie? Because the plastics take up room in their digestive system where food should be. So the quicker we get this out of our waters, the better for everybody. Um, and a lot of this is coming from rivers as well into our oceans. So um, we all need to um, have a role in preventing all of this stuff getting in there in the first place. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your trash craft um, there, Ben, <laughs> and the, the boat that you have right now and that you're actually going to be fundraising for uh, a better um, craft to use. Talk to us a little bit about your um, your quest. Yeah, um, so right now we have one, our kind of our uh, maiden craft, I guess, our maiden vessel is, uh, the tr we call it the trash craft, is what we've coined it, and it's a uh, boat that we got early last year and we fixed it up and uh, we've taken on a few adventures and it's been, it's basically doubled our capacity and our accessibility to remove debris remotely. 
because we have a vessel that can pull up and we can load it right on there and take it right back to harbor with us instead of needing helicopter or barge support in those remote areas, which gets expensive and um, not very cost effective. It's not very efficient to be doing that for it seems a little counterintuitive to use all those resources to get the get the plastic out of. So it's this helps us big time. And it's been it's been great. It's been a lot of fun with the trash craft. We're actually uh, in talk. Some good friends of ours um, are in a band called Carmana. And one of the uh, one of the members of that band is versed in um, swapping over diesel engines to biofuel. So it runs on uh, vet, old vegetable oil, old vegetable oil from deep fryers, essentially. So they've been doing that with his truck for their touring van for years. And we're in talks with him of maybe because it has the same engine actually in the trash craft as his truck does. So we're thinking of swapping it over to biodiesel, and it can be our our biodiesel powered trash collector, which is amazing, <laughs> which is a, a lot of fun. Um, and you mentioned a new boat that we're uh, going for right now, and it's uh, essentially we hit our limit pretty quickly with the trash craft. Um, we can fill it up in about a day and a half. Um, and that's with a crew of about eight, eight people or so. So any kind of larger scale cleanups just requires us to accumulate it all in areas and we have to leave it there and hopefully make trips back. And that's, again, pretty resource heavy. So our plan is to uh, purchase another boat, fundraise, and purchase another boat that's going to be um, a landing craft that's going to essentially um, about triple our capacity that we can bring back with us on, on each trip which is going to be amazing. And uh, so far we're doing pretty good. We've got the, we've got the hull funded already in our fundraising campaign, which is amazing. So it's a great, I think it's a 32 foot aluminum landing craft and it's, so the deck space is massive. And so that's the very first step. And now we need to fundraise to make sure we can wire it and get engines for it. And I think we're going to put a little, a small crane on it. So it kind of lessens the, the hazards of us bringing these heavy, sacks mm. and debris and stuff onto it and offloading it it just it'll expedite our efficiency uh very well throughout so we're kind of in the in the, just in the starting stages of really getting fundraising on that so that's gonna that's our next endeavor over over 2021 very good mm -hmm. and uh, you've only been around uh Rennie, since uh, 2017 but you've already been able to acquire a lot of partners and sponsors for a very young society and I might add, including Shaw TV uh, is our sponsor. So we're very proud to be uh, participating with you on that endeavor. Um, what have been some of the challenges in terms of forming this society and getting people involved? Is there a shortage of volunteers right now? Are you looking to recruit more people? Yeah, no, I know. I wouldn't say we have um, there's not a shortage of volunteers. Everybody wants to wants to come out and help out and. And actually, uh, one of our our our, our biggest bottlenecks is is uh, is th this new vessel, because um, we want to be able to get those volunteers out to the beaches to be able to help us clean. Um, and so that getting that new vessel will will be able to do that, be able to uh, overcome that challenge and get more people out there. Um, but in addition to that, uh, there isn't a lot of historically there hasn't been a lot of grants or financial support um, for this type of work. Um, and so we really have relied on on donations from the community and from the public to help us um, with our with our gas and and uh, equipment to, to do this work. And so we have we've had really good support here in Nanaimo. Uh, there's a, a fund uh, called the the Stanley DeVos Fund that's administered through the Nanaimo Foundation, and they've uh, they've taken a shining to us and they've been helping us uh, largely along our way. So that's been very appreciative. And then and then we've had some good fundraisers. So. Right now we're we're doing well. Our gas has been getting paid for, and our crafts of to date have been have been uh, funded. Um, so yeah, I think the the biggest challenge though is is just is just that that is that there is no government. There hasn't been any government funding or anything like that to help with our operations. We really had to lean on the community for that. Uh, but this year it's it's it's, it's a new year. The government has released uh, a nine point five million for 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 beach cleanup for this year. And, and so we're in the application process for two large scale projects. So hopefully our, our hurdles are, are no longer. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Congratulations, you guys. You're doing really, really well. Uh, ben, over to you. Just talk to us a little about the cleanup that you did earlier this year in tw or in 2020, pardon me, we're in a new year, um, at the Deer Archipelago. Talk to us a bit about that particular cleanup. There looked to be a lot of camaraderie going on too and some families and pets involved. Uh, it looked like a fun thing to do. 
Yeah, actually, um, most of our cleanups and our, sur our survey missions and everything that we're doing is is a we have a door wide open kind of policy for for family and pets and we know we understand that these places are pretty pretty special so the more eyes that get out there and the more uh, Rennie and I both have um, a young daughter and we're just we always talk about how exciting it is to bring them up in this world with their eyes open to see to see these places and see the the things that are threatening them and active and kind of blend in their um, recreation with their giving back to the places that they that they care for that they want to protect so yeah it's always it's always an open door anybody that is showing is interested in coming along we have lots of people reaching out and we have different crews coming kind of all, all the time as as um, space permits and uh, the deer group uh, cleanup this fall was a perfect example of that we had uh we had a couple people from, there's another organization that we've partnered with on a few things called Parlay for the Oceans. They're a, a pretty large scale nonprofit out of, out of the U.S. And they have uh, some members that during COVID have been quarantined and are uh, basically in Canada with their families and stuff. So they were able, they were able to come along with us and support us in, in the mission, a little, some, some financial support and just having that manpower and those eyes and that kind of um, attention to it is, is huge. Uh, we had uh, a good friend of ours, Agat Bernard, a photographer, an amazing photographer, come along who shot some great photos of the people and the and the adventures. And uh, that one that one was great because the deer group isn't isn't real far away from. Uh, you go to Port Alberni and it's about an hour and a half run out of Port Alberni. It's right near Bamfield and it's got a. It doesn't feel very far away. Uh, or essentially, it feels far away, but you're not far away. So it's something that makes it very accessible to people that want to come along. It doesn't necessarily require as big of a time commitment, or um, or you can you can rely on. I'm, I'm a perfect example of this. Actually, that was the first trip I did with Rugged Coast, and one of the first trips that I did on the West Coast actually was a deer group trip a couple of years ago. So it was just getting out there and realizing that oh wow, this is right here. This is somewhere where. I can I can get to pretty easily. Me and my friends can come. We can come back here. Anybody has a boat, or you can and you can drive to Bamfield, and you're right almost in the center of it. You're right amongst it. So having that area feel so rugged, but be fairly accessible, and having the amount of debris just in that area, um, being having the eyes on it with all those different mix of people was pretty pretty powerful. So we. We did pretty good on that one. We got, I didn't, I'm not sure if Randy wants to speak to exactly the, the tonnage that came out of it, the, the weight that came out of it, but I think it was around 500 kilograms or so that we pulled out just in a, just in a couple of days with some very enthusiastic volunteers. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I can, I can see the passion in your voice. It's, it's really <laughs> nice to see that, that passion for plastic. I love it. Um, <laughs> we've got about uh, five minutes left, um, Renny. Just want to, how can we, each play a part here in helping to prevent plastic from getting into the waterways in the first place. What are some tips that our viewers can take away with today? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I think that one of the, the biggest things we can do is, is just be really conscious about what we purchase and, uh, and the plastics that we purchase. And, and, you know, when you go shopping, bring your reusable, uh, your re reusable bags and, and try not to select the, the waste or, or, or products that have a lot of waste associated with them. Um, also, when, when you're out, when, when people are out on adventures, they can clean up, they can help, you know, when you're walking the beach, you can bring a bag with you and, and just clean up, clean up your local areas. Um, and also helping groups like ours, there's, there's, there's quite a few um, nonprofits like ours up and down the island um, that, that, that do do cleanups and, and organize cleanups throughout the summer and come out and help out and, and uh, join, the, join the teams. It's a very uh, open community of, of environmental minded individuals that, that love uh, love more support. So I would say those are the, the key ways that people can help. Very good. And also as, as consumers, you know, be conscious of some of the uh, um, products that we use in like face washes and toothpastes and because micro uh, plastics are also a problem, like polyethylene and polypropylene are in a lot of products that we use. And if we just get a little more conscious about looking at those labels and not purchasing products that have those harmful um, ingredients in them, not only harmful to us, but to the marine life as well. Yeah, the leading... So in the all lead play. Yeah, the leading source of, of microplastics in, in the ocean is actually from textiles and so mm -hmm. clothing. So you know, 
fleeces and you know when you're using um, when you're when you're purchasing your uh, uh, clothing if you if you buy a, 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 a natural fibers wool and cotton and things like that then then you're doing our oceans a favor that way as well because a lot of fleece material uh, is made out of microfibers, um, things that we've been commonly using that we may not be aware um, that they're actually, every time you wash them, some of those uh, microplastics are being released into our waters. So, yeah. Um, what's up uh, next? What's your next um, uh, outing, uh, Ben? Where are you heading in the next few months? Um, our next big adventure is, like Randy mentioned, we're uh, in the middle of uh, an application phase for a kind of some fairly for us some very large scale funding from the BC government to do some uh, good cleanups kind of we have one project in the South Sailor Sea from the Noose to Victoria um, mm -hmm. and then we have another we're part of another application for some more remote areas on the west coast um, so our next adventure is uh, over the next couple of weeks getting our hopefully getting uh, being successful in that application process and then we're going to start planning between those so we have three locations on the west coast of a two-week time period each, and then in between that, we're going to be out on the on the coast here. So if you see our trash craft out on the water this spring, say hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. And Rennie, any closing thoughts from you today, and how viewers can help support your work? Uh, I think the, the the yeah, I think I think the, I just wanted to thank you for for having us on the show, and and uh, and I hope viewers do to take a look at our website and. And if you want to get involved, reach out to reach out to us, um, and uh, and try and reduce those plastics. Take a bag with you when you go to the beach. It's going to be a nice summer. <laughs> Pretty simple. Um, and I was also going to ask. I know that you're what you're doing here is along our our local coast, uh, but are you also in partnership at all with the the ocean cleanup the, from the Pacific uh, trash patch that's between California and Hawaii? which is about the size of BC and Alberta combined. I'm sure a lot of the trash that you're finding is coming from, you know, that collective source where the waves and currents and everything are sort of collecting it globally there. Um, are any connections there or are you working um, in your own region? Uh, right now we're working our own region. Um, we do have aspirations to, to, to expand our reach. Um, and also, we want to start looking at, at the research component uh, of, of plastic. We've been focusing on the cleanups, um, but we do want to start looking at microplastics um, in bivalves and that actually get into our, our, our ecosystems here. And so that type of information will help inform uh, cleanups like the, like, the, like the ocean cleanup and, and uh, provide more weight to that. And, and um, so we do, we're going to be looking for synergies and, and ways that we can get involved and other cleanups uh, moving forward, no question. Very good. Thank you very much, Rennie Talbot and Ben Armstrong from the Broadwood Coast Research Society. You truly are local heroes in what you're doing to help clean up our waters and protect what we love, which is your tagline for your society. And, you know, keep our ocean playgrounds um, healthy and restore them where they're not, not only for ourselves, but for all the marine life, the plants that we uh, share this beautiful coastline with. Thank you very much for the work that you're doing with your nonprofit organization. And I just encourage our viewers to get onto their website, uh, see how you might be able to support this as well in big or large ways or contact for them, you know, to perhaps volunteer or maybe you have, uh, you know, some spare cash that you'd like to help support this with. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Elizabeth Hines and I look forward to seeing you again on our next episode of Coast Connections. Thank you very much. Thank you.